Hello, I am Robert Deltz. I, I'm a co-author with Tim Halbum and Susie Smith of the book Beliefs, Pathways to Health and Well-Being, which is published by Crown House Publishers. And I just wanted to say a few words about this book. Um, I, first of all, I've, I've written over 25 books, and I have to say that that book is probably the book that has been the bestseller of them all. Um, I think that's due to a couple of things. One is because I think the, the book is addressing some very um, practical, real issues. Uh, it's, it's not an intellectual book about health. It's, a, it's actually uh, edited transcripts that are coming from programs that have been done about health. I think probably the other reason that this book has uh, is, uh, been a good seller is my co-authors, who are also sort of the, the editors and helped to really put this together, I think, in a very um, uh, you know, simple um, and easy to follow set of steps. Um, the idea of belief is that the way that we believe our, our, you know, our internal, say our sort of internal filters, is going to make a big difference in how we approach something. And the whole notion of, of our beliefs uh, and, and their influence on our health, I think is very important. We all know that there are physical influences, but in terms of our being able to be proactive about how to manage our health, um, how to go about being able to work with, with symptoms, any type of symptom is actually you know, very important. So we're looking at the influence of belief, what a belief is. Uh, there's a series of exercises of how you can define those beliefs, work with those beliefs, and we would say sort of transform some of the limiting beliefs that we might have relating to our health and well-being into empowering beliefs. Uh, so uh, again, this is a book that is, is very much taken from live interactions. There are a lot of demonstrations that you can go through. Interestingly, we did, did not intend this as a self-help book, but it's actually been embraced as a self-help book by a lot of people. And I've gotten feedback from many people that after having read this book, it's made a tremendous difference for them and their own health and their ability to support others. So I think you'll find it a, a very unique book uh, and one that I think will really um, in some ways add to your ability to um, um, manage your own health as well as support others to do so. So uh, I think it will be something that's uh, something very valuable and interesting. Dr. Cowart, why did you write the ABCs of coping with anxiety? For the last several decades, I've been engaged in providing cognitive behavioral therapy to patients who suffer with anxiety problems and anxiety disorders and also supervising other therapists who did that same kind of work. And from that work and also from my readings, I came to see that anxiety is an incredibly common problem, very frequently found, and yet many people don't get appropriate treatment because anxiety is not is often under-diagnosed and under-treated. A lot of people don't get cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. And as a result of all that, I, I wanted to develop a resource that would be helpful to patients who suffered with anxiety and to people, even if they weren't in therapy. And so uh, along those dec decades of work, I developed with others the ABCs, which is a set of basic coping skills, four basic coping skills that allow people to make good progress with their anxiety disorders and problems uh, if they can apply those coping skills. And that, that proved to be very useful, uh, not only in therapy, but after therapy ended and follow up. And so um, I want now to make that available to other people, even those who are not in therapy, as well as those that are. In addition, another reason is because I want therapists to have that resource, a, a good teaching tool that would help them to teach the basic coping skills to their own patients. So those are the, the main reasons that I developed the ABCs. Hello, I'm Robert Deltz and I'm co-author with Stephen Gilligan of the book The Hero's Journey, A Voyage of Self-Discovery that is published by Crown House uh, Publishers. 
And I want to just say a few words about the book. Uh, first of all, I think this notion of a hero's journey is probably one of the most important things that we can be learning and exploring in today's challenging world. The idea of a hero's journey is that our life circumstances are frequently calling us to sort of step up and become more of the potential that we have. Um, and to meet those outer challenges and outer circumstances of our life, it, we have to grow on the inside. And that's why we say it's a voyage of self-discovery. And the whole notion here is that uh, through our lives and in many different areas of our lives, we're going to be meeting uh, challenges, crises, whether it's a health crisis, whether it's a crisis as we might be finding in today's uh, uh, challenging world of a pandemic or if it's a challenge in relationship or a change in professional uh, activity. We're going to be meeting these challenges and the notion of the hero's journey, which was originally established by a man named Joseph Campbell, is that the way in which we meet these challenges, there's a, there's a kind of a structure to it. And if we can understand that structure, we can move from being sort of victimized, we could say the opposite of being a hero is a victim, we can move from being victimized to actually embracing the situation. This is what's the notion of what's called the calling. Uh, we can find that calling. We say we can cross the threshold. We then gather our guardians. We then, in, in this language of the hero's journey, we can meet the dragons or the demons and, and the shadows that they bring up inside of us. And by transforming something on the inside, we're able to be more resourceful, more creative, more successful on the outside. And so this book will takes you through all of these stages of the hero's journey. It's based on a an actual seminar that Stephen and I did together. So it's transcripts. It's very much, It's a. I think one of the great things about this book is it's very alive. There's a lot of demonstrations. So um, it's not it's not an intellectual discourse on the hero's journey. It's a guiding, it's kind of a guidebook to take you through that journey yourself. So I think you'll find it to be something unique, uh, something exciting and something very valuable. Hello, I'm Gillian Bridge, author of Sweet Distress, How Our Love Affair with Feelings Has Fueled Current Mental Health Crisis and What We Can Do About It. I've written the book because I feel that we've been hijacked by thinking that says that only emotions and feelings count and that's the only way we can get better mental health. I want to dispute that and I want to dispute it with the evidence from science that says that sometimes the very opposite actually is better for us, not emphasising emotions and feelings quite so much. And um, that's why I called it sweet distress, because we have been in thrall to lots of sweet substances which have made us physically not as healthy as we would like to be. And I feel that sometimes emotions and feelings fall into the same psychological category of things that seem sweet, but are actually not particularly good for us. So it's quite a challenging read and um, I'm putting the ideas out there and hope that I will get lots of response from readers and a lot of feedback that tells me how you also feel about the current situation and whether or not you think that there are some brilliant ideas in here which can be implemented for the better mental health of all of us. Um, so I'd love to hear from you when you've had a chance to read it. Thank you. Bye bye. I was on a flight back from Dublin with my friend Katie, having run a leadership conference for students together when we decided to write this book. My name is Emmy and my background is in economics. I worked for the government prior to becoming a teacher. Katie had served in the British Army and co-founded a global social leadership movement that was taking off across the world. She was also partway through a PhD in leadership at Oxford University at the time and we'd been running leadership courses and coaching courses together for several years. It was the summer of 2018 and hot balmy days had been filled with a national fervour as the England football team had progressed further and further in the World Cup. Despite brutal predictions and against all the odds, Gareth Southgate had led the team to their first World Cup semi-final since 1990. Not only had he given fans a fantastic summer of sport, but it also inspired a whole generation of young footballers to a new vision of football as professional, compassionate and honourable. He seemed to epitomise many of the key lessons that Katie and I had been researching and teaching on. That the best leaders know their people, 
love their people and inspire their people. Katie and I love the rigour of academic research, but our real passion is to make that research accessible so that as many people as possible are inspired and equipped to apply it in their lives. Leaders really are made, they're not born. We can all learn to lead. In fact, Gareth Southgate was a great example of that, having been booed off the pitch by his own fans and dismissed as manager of Middlesbrough Football Club back in 2009. We've seen many people thrust into leadership positions with very little support or training. So we wrote this book to be an accessible, practical and optimistic summary of the latest research on leadership. We love the fact that Gareth Southgate made compassionate leadership attractive. And so we've interwoven stories and interviews throughout the book, from the corporate sector to healthcare, education to the sports field, the military to NGOs. These leaders aren't perfect, none of us are, but we need role models and narratives that will encourage us on the journey to becoming real leaders. Leadership isn't easy, but building the right foundations of knowing, loving and inspiring people is not only intrinsically valuable for flourishing, but also the most important factor in achieving success. We really hope that you'll enjoy the book. Hi, my name is Andrew Bernard and I want to talk to you about my new book, The Ladder. It's been released from Crown House and Independent Thinking. Supporting students towards successful futures and confident career choices. Um, I'm going to take you through the chapters and what they're all about. The first one is called You Are Here. And it asks you to question how you got to where you got to. Whatever position in your, your company, your school, um, how did you get there? Who helped you? Who held your ladder? And what was your pathway like? Was it straight and direct or did, were there lots of kind of random uh, choices and turns in it? That's what I want you to reflect on because that's what young people that you work with, they're going to have ex those experiences as well. Chapter two is called The Cask, the continuum for the acquisition of skills and knowledge. It's a set of seven very simple tools that allow your students to become aware of, support, celebrate and become more confident in their skills. So not just academic skills, but skills from um, sport, music, part-time work um, and other skills that they've got that they don't even realise as a skill. Languages, you know, babysitting, all those kind of things. They're brilliant skills and they're a brilliant way of reflecting on what the whole person looks like. Um, chapter three, equalities of careers opportunity. Now, this is all about a research chapter, which is all about how you can overcome some of the difficulties that you, these young people have got using research backed ideas and um, ways of overcoming these stereotypes and things that stop people, young people from de developing into the pe person that they could be. Number four, applying the Gatsby benchmarks. The Gatsby benchmarks are obviously being used across schools in the UK to measure careers performance. I just want to help you to kind of analyse those and look at ways in which you can make sure that you support them and you meet the Gatsby benchmarks to improve careers provision within your school. Number five, teaching tools. There are 20 unique tools in there which you can use and apply across different subject areas. And there's also subject specific links to different types of jobs that use those skills. To answer those questions, why are we learning this? It's all in there. Number six, challenging stereotypes. By the age of seven, young people, children, pupils have started to form stereotypes about what type of people do what kind of jobs. This is a brilliant way of overcoming that specifically for STEM careers. We need more engineers. How are we going to support that? If people think that they, they can't be an engineer, if they're a girl, they can't do physics, if they're a girl, or you know they don't see the kind of person that they are reflected in the, uh, the makeup of the demographic of the people that do those jobs that they're interested in. Um, the next one, resources, programs and support. So chapter seven is all about who's out there to help you. Most of it is free and what support do they offer you and your students towards more confident future careers. Number eight, supporting students with SEND diagnosis. There are three case studies from three experts in their field talking about how careers opportunities can be developed for students with SEND diagnosis of various different types. Number nine, businesses, the how and why of involvement in schools, how they can get involved, why they should get involved um, and how that can really help not only the, the schools themselves, students, teachers, young people's understanding, but also help the people in your business to become 
more confident, more comfortable and more fulfilled in your daily work. Number 10 is questions. Questions, questions, questions. Questions teachers can ask their SLT. Questions teachers can ask local businesses. How can your governors help? How can you become a governor? Questions to ask your students. The whole chapter is questions from various different organisations that are involved in supporting young people and on their career ladder, but also questions that you can ask outside to get more people involved to support your students. And finally, chapter 11 is about over to you. What are you going to do? It starts with the idea of marginal gains. What tiny things could you do across all subject areas which would improve the confidence and aspirations and attitude of your young people towards feeling more confident about themselves, their skills and where they're going to be in the future. So that's the ladder out now from Crown House. Thanks very much. Hello, my name's Angus MacLeod. Uh, and I've been asked to give you some insight as to why I wrote this book, Performance Coaching, the handbook for managers, HR professionals and coaches. Uh, and this book is published by Crown House some years ago now uh, and in its, I think, fifth uh, imprint. Now, I've for many years thought that uh, very often people try and add value to what they're selling, whether it's a book or a training course, uh, by making things complicated, by putting too much text on the page, too much information, and really not being clear and getting ideas and the practical application of that knowledge across. And so I really felt that um, in my field of coaching, that something better ought to be done. And it, the traditional approach has always been, and still is, to set out a whole bunch of tools, one after the other, uh, perhaps with examples. And I decided there was another way to do this, and that was to look at real life situations that managers have, whether it's a lack of confidence, whether it's something to do with presentation, maybe because there's a problem with their boss or somebody that works for them, a difficult individual to deal with, and to take those particular issues and then track the coaching conversations of those issues so that you get a story, a dialogue, and then beyond the dialogue to pull out certain specific uh, specialist areas of coaching and pop those into little boxes so that you can just carry on reading if you want to. Um, perhaps you know what that particular tool is and don't need to go and look at that and have it all explained for you. It's pulled out into a box if you want to, you can then look at that and study it and then go back to the text again. Highly cross-referenced, so it's a practical book that you can work around. Um, and really, I hope, giving people the possibility both to do some exercises for themselves, um, to use as a, as a reference book for particular tools if they want to find them. It's very cross-referenced, there's lots of, um, lots of indexes and things in it. Um, and that was really my objective in, in writing this book. It's still, I think, the only book of its type that th takes that approach. It's also, of course, uh, one of the um, recommended books for, by Newcastle College um, for the two uh, diploma courses uh, which I designed for Newcastle College. And we've had, of course, over 15,000 students um, who have gone through those courses. But what do other people say about this? Chris Akabusi, uh, the Olympic gold medalist, a practical book with wonderful ideas, uh, perspectives and tips, Angus McLeod's experience oozes out of every page, uh, an ideal book for newly qualified coaches serious about their profession. Sir John uh, Whitmore um, says with this book, Angus McLeod sets a high standard of teaching. His examples of coaching dialogues serve so well to illustrate how to skillfully handle many coaching situations. And the layout and subheadings make them accessible to those who want to dip in and out of the book as required. I enjoyed it and I learned from it. So that's some of the things that other people have to say about uh, the book. I don't intend to um, talk about it in those terms myself, but um, I hope you found my inspiration for writing this book uh, of interest and I thank you for listening.